Hello everyone. I uh, wanted to spend some time discussing and looking at PowerPoint slides for chapter 16. Uh, last chapter will cover S corporations. Uh, a little background on S corporations. First of all, we want to think corporation, they operate from a liability and from an operational standpoint the same as a C corporation in that they have a board of directors or should have a board of directors, they should have officers, uh, that sort of thing. They are formed in most states the same way as a regular corporation, uh, but they are taxed differently. Two different, uh, actually in the code, there is subchapter C and subchapter S, and that's where the name comes from. Subchapter C talks about how to tax C corporations, what we talked about in chapter 14, and subchapter S, S corporations. So that is uh, where that terminology is from and what we're going to talk about. They are taxed more like a partnership, so they operate like a corporation, but their taxation is more like what we talked about in chapter 15, as you'll see. Now there's a separate uh, you might say, power, I mean, uh, podcast about the differences uh, between S corporations and partnerships. Mostly we'll look in this slides about the similarities, uh, but you can review the differences there as well. Some of it will overlap a little bit as well. So to be an S corporation, you have to follow this, these four characteristics. Domestic, that means inside the United States, one class of stock, no preferred or common stock, no more than 100 shareholders, and the shareholders are limited to a fairly limited number of uh, individuals. So meaning it can't be another corporation, it cannot be a partnership, it can be an estate, a trust, a certain trust, not every trust, and individuals, and not an outside the United States individual, non-resident alien. So limited to who and how many and the classes of stock. Can't be uh, to have different distribution or liquidation rights. It can be okay to have different voting rights. So that's been allowed by uh, tax law. No more than 100 shareholders sounds uh, pretty easy, and especially since a couple of years ago they decided that all family members count as one shareholder. So that includes all kinds of descendants and ancestors, spouses, former spouses. So example, your woman, your children, or grandchildren, and great-grandchildren are all family members and would count as one shareholder. So there's one, uh, there's 10, 16 people count as one. So it's really not hard to stay under the 100, uh, 100 shareholder limit. Okay, in order to be taxed as an S corporation, you have to elect. It's nothing is automatic. Nothing happens by chance. You have to send in the form uh, and all of the shareholders to this corporation must sign it. All right, so this is form 2553. Um, basically, it's just a play you know, a form that has a place for signatures of all the shareholders and you elect when it's, it's going to be effective. Now, if you can do it in the first two and a half months of the year, let's assume calendar year, if you do it by March 15th of 2018, it will be retroactive to the beginning of the year. If you do it after that, then it will uh, take place the following year, okay? So that's what uh, is the, the standard. Now there is some leeway if you were late for a good reason. The IRS has waived that and made it effective, but uh, that is the general rule. Now on, if you want to stop being an S corporation, now if you be, stop being an S, you become a C. C is the default. Uh, S corporation is the special election. You can only terminate, you can terminate if you have over half. Notice it was all for starting, but it's only over half if you want to stop. Okay, so a little less uh, serious there. It can be done a lot more easily. Now, that's if you choose, that's a voluntary termination. Uh, you can also terminate inadvertently, let's say, 
Um, this may be on purpose, may not be, but if you require any of the, violate any one of those four requirements listed earlier, you go over 100 shareholders, you uh, have declare a second class of stock, you uh, uh, have a shareholder that is not uh, qualified. Any of those things will terminate the S election uh, if you're in violation of those at the date that that happens. There's sometimes a little bit of a leeway for you to correct it if it was inadvertent, but that's the day it will happen. It happens is when the election is terminated. Okay, now there's another one for those that are S corporations that used to be C corporation, is they're about passive investment income, and that's very rare. Because most S corporations were S corporations from the get go, from the start. Now, what's the required tax year? Since most corporation shareholders are individuals and most individuals are calendar year, S corporations are generally going to default to calendar year, but they can elect that natural business year. Remember, if there's a significant amount of their business, over 25% in a couple of months, because of the seasonal nature of their business, that would could be you could use a natural business year or if you don't cause a deferral more than three months similar rules to partnerships you remember those all right everything passes through to the shareholders just like they pass through to partners in the partnership uh, you have the items that are ordinary income and those that are treated differently as separately stated items and really the list is very similar almost the same as uh, for a partnership. So these are your separately stated items. Everything else, all other business, ordinary is ordinary income and is reported as such. Okay, so again, the same reasons. Those things that are separately stated make it be treated differently for each shareholder's individual return. Says so Corporation files 1120S. 1120 for C Corporation, 1120S for S corporations. Uh, two and a half months after the year end, and you get a six month extension with Form 7004. Notice that's the same form as partnerships. Uh, so that's kind of a multi purpose form. It can, it's an extension for lots of different entities. You check which entity you're filing for extension for. All right. Ordinary items, of ordinary income, and ordinary loss are on. Allocated shares on a per share per day basis. That means for every day you own that stock for that during that tax year uh, times the percentage that you have uh, ownership in the stock. And we'll see an example how that will play out a little bit later. Uh, that's reported to you as an individual, as the owner, as a shareholder, if you will, on K1. That's the same. Name of the form for 1065 for partnership. So you have to notice up in the corner if it says it's K1 for 1120 or S or for a 1065. 1120 S for uh, sh shareholders in an S corporation, 1065 for K1 for the partners in a partnership. Because for the most part, it's really hard looking at it to tell the difference because the same things are listed. All right, per out of share, per of the shareholders. All right, let's, we're going to look, just before we go into this example, look at the 1120S so I can convince you it very much looks like a 1065. Here on page one is ordinary income. All right, it's ordinary business income right here. This, these except these, few little taxes here should very seldom apply. There's a couple of oddball things that can cause an S corporation to pay taxes. There's none that can cause a partnership to pay taxes. But there are a couple of things that we're not going to spend time on and not worry about for S corporations. All right. Then just like with the partnership, there's a whole bunch of questions, most of which will be no on page two. Page three is the Schedule K, this is the total amounts of separately stated items. All right, and then just like on a uh, partnership, there is the uh, Schedule L balance sheet, all right? So the K, 
then transfers to the K1, the percentage that each shareholder owns. So starts with a K, Schedule K gets allocated to the K1. So back to our example, 10% of shares in a corporation during the year S Corporation reports 55,000 and 2,000 charitable contributions. So what's going to happen on so that 55,000 and the 2,000 would be on the K because that's the total. Morgan's going to get a K1 and what is that going to say? It's going to show 5,500 or 10% of the ordinary income and 200, 10% of the charitable contributions. Everything's done on a percentage basis. And she's going to get a K1 with those two numbers on. She's going to take the 5,500, put on the Schedule E, page 2. That's where partnerships, S corporations are all reported on the individual's tax return. And then the 200 is just going to go as a regular charitable contribution on Schedule A, uh, like back in Chapter 5 and 6. 20% this time, but in this situation, they sell their shares on September 5th. So they don't own it all year long. So what do you do? You take your 55,000 times the 20% times the number of days, if day counts, divide by 365. And the same thing with the charitable contribution. So literally you do it on a per day pro rata basis with an S corporation. Okay, losses for an S corporation can only deduct up to their basis. That sounds very similar to partnerships and anything you can't deduct this year must be carried forward till you have sufficient basis in the future. How does the basis get there? Well, this is the same items in the same order, if you will, ordinary income and separately stated items. Those all affect basis, additional contributions and distributions, similar, same as uh, partnership. But the important thing is as corporations do not change their basis with the debt or the liabilities of the corporation unless it is an actual loan that the shareholder makes to the corporation. That will increase your basis. Any other loans don't affect basis on an S corporation. So... Example, this is a multi-year example where it's 100%, starts at 15,000 during the year. The S corporation has operating losses of 20,000. She's not going to be able to use it all. She has to carry over the 5,000 loss to the next year. Okay? Uh, oh, that's a, a later example. is going to be multi-year. This was just one year. Distribution from an S corporation are tax-free. This AAA account is just the amount of income that has been earned by the S corporation but not distributed to shareholders, sort of like retained earnings um, uh, in a regular corporation. Cannot be, can be below zero, but it can't be because of a distribution that causes it to go below zero. A distribution cannot be bring it below zero, and if you get a distribution that is going to make it zero, that is actually a taxable transaction. Especially if there is EMP left over from a C corporation. Okay, return capital, and then it's treat. So, here's DG, this is the multi. Example, do you have $5,000 of EMP, one shareholder, $20,000 basis. Ordinary income in $12,000. So his income on his tax return is $12,000. Increases his basis $32,000. The AA balance is $12,000 one year. Since they become an S corporation, they've only earned $12,000. Okay, year two. Ordinary income is $15,000, but they distribute $18,000. How much does our, our AA balance increases by $15,000? Doug reports 15 of income on his taxes and his basis increases by 15. Then the 18,000 is distributed and it's tax free to Doug, right? Because it's no more than the AAA account. It reduces the AAA to 9,000, all right? And his basis um, becomes 29. Remember, it was 32 at the end of the year before. Add the 15 from the income and subtract 18 from 
distribution. Okay, now it's 6,800 and 8,400, distributing more again. This time it's a loss. So it reduces the AAA account to 2,200. It reduces the basis, Doug's basis. All right, so in this case, 2,200 is distributed. That's what's remaining amount in his AAA account, Doug. The next $5,000 reduces EMP. That's the earnings and profits from when they were a C corporation and is dividend income. That's what you don't want to have happen typically. If there is no EMP, then it would all be a return of capital until the base, his original amount he paid for the stock is reduced. In this case, it was reduced by 1,200. No loss on the distribution of property to shareholders. When we distribute property that is has a gain, the gain is recognized and the gain increases AAA and the shareholders basis in the in their stock. Then when the fair market value distributed, the AAA is reduced by the fair market value and that fair market value becomes shareholders basis in that property and the shareholders basis in the corporation is also reduced so Rena distributes land 50,000 basis in land is 14 there's a $36,000 gain on the S corporation tax return that's going to go to Irina on her K K1 and any other shareholders on the S corporation if there were more but in this case she's the only one that increases the AAA balance as well as her basis then that is distributed the 50,000 reduces arena's basis and reduces the AAA and IDGG by the same amount. Same idea in this case except now we are distributing at a loss. There's no loss recognized on the property that's declining in value. You distribute at the fair market value in every case. That's the amount that reduces the AAA. That's the amount that Jamie's basis required no benefit from this loss. So moral of the story is don't do this. All right. That's the end of our narrated slides on S-corporations.